Good morning. Thank you for all being here nice and early. And um, as it says in the program, we're going to be talking about where from, where to, a manifesto about Doctors 2.0. I'm going to speak first about the web. And this reminds me of something I just heard yesterday. Uh, in fact, there's somebody here named uh, René, who's from Holland, and he told me that when he got to the Gare du Nord, there was a huge line for the taxis. So he, maybe anybody else had the same problem here. So he, um, he took out his uh, phone, I guess, and he tweeted, Doctors 2.0 on way, uh, waiting for taxi. And Tim Lloyd, who was up front of the line, saw this tweet, stepped out of the line to see who it was, and the other guy got into his taxi. So, so the web is everywhere. We're going to then talk about the health web. And I'm going to try and make sense out of the program. There's today's agenda seen as a word cloud. So here's an interesting photo. Has anybody seen it? So this was actually a hoax. It was presented as 2004, seen by the Rand Corporation in the 1950s. The reality is that this was a computer that was condensed to fit into a submarine. But look at how huge it was then. And people recently believed that this was a vision of the year 2000. Why did they believe that? Because it's impossible to predict things. With the internet, things are going so fast that it would be very pretentious to say that you could predict. Because in fact, this is what it has become this global set of connections. This was seen by, the, by Bell Laboratories, this image. And now I'd like to get closer to you because this is about people. And we have in the room people from about 20 countries. And what I think is fascinating with this chart, which you can create yourself on Google Data, is to see what has happened since the late 1990s. So there's been a huge jump, say from 98 until now, and all of the countries are really using it, all of the developed countries. We see that, um, of course, uh, India, Ivory Coast, and Algeria that are present are below the average. We also see that Sweden and the Netherlands, as it was said yesterday, are the highest. They're close to 90%. And um, I use the word manifesto not by accident because I found this extremely interesting. Many of you here have probably read the book, Train Manifesto. Clutrain Manifesto spoke about the need for a global conversation and that community is a group of people who care about each other. We have many Twitter communities, Facebook communities, and real communities present here. And what's fascinating is when was this written? This is exactly the definition of social media. It was written in 1999. So even before the word 2.0, which is traced to 2004. So I'm going to go run through you these two, 10 past years. Wikipedia, which is now around number seven or eight amongst all websites that are consulted and consulted both by physicians and patients because it's consulted by people. There's a place on Wikipedia where you can get the latest statistics. And so there are nine million views per hour of Wikipedia. And over three million articles in English, the next language being German. This is all thanks to volunteer contributors. The language after that, French and then uh, Italian, Polish. This is not representative of the percent on the web. English is much lower now than first place. But this reflects the generosity of volunteers who are contributing and who are editing. So Facebook. You know that on April 20th, Barack Obama went to California to meet with Mark Zuckerberg and his crowd. Zuckerberg got out of his gym clothes for once. And less than two months later, never to be outdone, Sarkozy was seeing Zuckerberg in Deauville. This is the world of Facebook. These are all the connections of people using Facebook, and these are the figures. It's predicted that Facebook would reach one billion by next year. 
Facebook is slowing down in developed countries as it reaches the 50, 60 percent, but there's a lot of other growth potential, so the one billion is certainly possible. And as we are speaking in these few minutes, two billion messages, two billion wall posts, the figures are boggling of what is happening on Facebook. So when people say to me, well, should I be present on Facebook with my cause, my organization, my corporation, my hospital? How can, why would you not be where people are? Why would you be just off alone on your own domain name? And Facebook is all about relationships. The people that you will meet in this room, you'll probably friend them afterwards. I think you know that one in five marriages are now attributed to Facebook and one in six divorces. YouTube, another uh, six-year-old. What is a six-year-old? Nothing. And yet, the second biggest search engine after Google, and that is why it belongs to Google. So it's three billion views a day. There are only two billion people using the internet, so the average person is seeing one and a half videos per day. And Twitter, which for a long time people were saying was too complicated, and given that you have to remain within 140 characters, for example, in France, people were saying it couldn't happen because the French language is longer than in English, for example. Well, now Twitter is the 13th website in France. And in the Huffington Post, which has now surpassed the New York Times online and is coming to all of Europe, it was noted that Twitter is one billion tweets per week. Um, the mobile phone, another incredible aspect. Yes, it's been out for over 20 years, but in France, for example, people would call it a where are you, t'es où, because the mobile phone follows you everywhere. Continuing on in the notion of quick change, when Steve Jobs, came back to Apple and invented the iPad, he really made history, and we'll be talking a lot about that today. It came out barely a, over a year ago, at the time of our last conference, and now it has reached an incredible path. What you see on the bottom in green is the iPod. How many of you can remember how fascinating it was to first have an iPod? Well, the iPod was totally crushed by the iPhone, which has itself been crushed in terms of sales, by the iPod, by the iPad. But all of this is nothing if it's not about people. It's not about machines, it's about people. And so what we've been seeing is that the world is being taken over by people using social media, using mobile devices, and using applications. So now for the healthcare part. Well, this is a great thing to know. There's a huge percent of doctors who say that the internet is essential to their practice. And we know that in India or Bangladesh, if it's lower, it's only because of a lack of resources, not because people wouldn't want to. And, and there's a, I think there are more computer programmers in India than in all of Europe. So it's not for a lack of interest in, in computers. And at the other end, we're really all around 80%. So this could be very positive. Doctors have computers, but what are they doing with them? Well, I don't know how many of you know this website, UpToDate. Since so many doctors were mentioning it to me, Victor, I'm sure you know UpToDate. You have a subscription. Probably everybody at the Mayo Clinic has a subscription, right? Um, so it's 9,000 topics, 4,000 physicians writing. And as you can see here, it is explaining the official recommendations. In Europe, most of the recommendation, the clinical recommendations to physicians are presented on PDF in 50 pages, 100 pages, and it's not usable. This encyclopedia for physicians makes it usable, so it's very attractive. Doctors are also going crazy over applications, like helping them better read an electrocardiogram, or even a latest application that can help read an image to know whether a person is having a stroke or not. This is something that used to be very complex telemedicine. It could now be done on an iPad. So this is all looking extremely happy to us.
So what are the doctors doing? I say they're all out shopping. They're catching up with women always wanting to go out shopping. Here they are buying their iPads. And why do they do that? Because they want to carry it around with them to their work. And what are they doing with it at their work? They're using it to expand medical knowledge, to access drug dictionaries. And in fact, four out of five American doctors have either bought or plan to buy an iPad and will finding the same types of figures around the world as long as they can afford it. And what are they doing with it? In the United States, an example, using the iPad with barcodes to make sure that it's the right patient. In Israel, advising from home about surgical operations because they can follow it on the iPad and therefore you can have the best surgeon who may not be in the operating room who can give a quick answer and see what's going on. There is an article about um, a hospital in Quebec where they are using it for the electronic medical record. So what about the patient in all of this? Well, the patients are also using the internet to the same extent as the physician, maybe 10% less, only because internet use is driven by social and economic resources. So not all patients are uh, as educated as physicians, but they are still using it, say, 60% around the world, and we will see this. You see in green, yes, sometimes, and this is 15 countries, this is an independent study done by Bupa that had nothing to gain from getting a higher result. So 60% of patients are saying at least yes, sometimes. And uh, frankly, it doesn't have to be every day. It's when they have a concern about healthcare. And what are they doing with it? They're looking for information on medicine. Yes, they're looking for information about their own diagnosis, even though some physicians don't want patients to tell them about this. They're looking for other patient experiences and to a lesser extent for information on hospital and doctors and social networks. The only reason it's to a lesser extent is because this is not as available. But is this going well? And I say no. Because everybody's always looking to criticize patients. They're saying that patients are likely to exaggerate if they put a physician review, so no reviews of physicians. They're saying that uh, the rating system in the hospital will never capture the reality of the hospital. They're saying that the patient shouldn't come and take the physician's time with information that anyway was a, uh, hasn't been pre-validated by some high priest. And if we look at communities, people are always talking about patients like me, and it's one of my favorite sites as a good example of collaboration. There are 350 million people uh, easily between the United States and Canada who could be using this site. There are only 108,000 patients on it. Yes, this is large, but it is very small compared to the percent of people who could potentially use such a site. In France alone, on a forum called Doctissimo that has millions of people, just the news part has over 2 million comments. So people are more likely to go into a forum and put a comment than to actually fill in data about themselves as we see is required for patients like me. And yet, as a result, somebody said it's really time for doctors to embrace social media. Patients want to find information and then have their doctor or somebody equivalent to discuss it with. And so we see this, for example, which is, she wants to discuss with her doctor and with other patients her skin condition, let's say. And he says, where do I find the time? What is my responsibility if I do so? And in fact, the AMA discourages physicians from interacting with patients. And yesterday in the French workshop, the French Order of Physicians, which is somewhat equivalent, said the same thing, a French physician should not friend a patient on Facebook. And so, this is the look of physicians when you talk to them about social media. Security, what happens if somebody hacks into my account, like Mr. Wiener, for example? What about my own privacy and the patient's privacy? 
and my time. He's wearing a nice expensive watch to check out his time. So fortunately, we have people like Gilles Friedman, who is here today, working on things called participatory medicine, a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible drivers of their health and can be viewed as valued partners. But a survey was done recently in Europe, and I believe the highest was the Netherlands. We came out with only 31% of physicians saying that they could conceive of the idea of the patient as a partner. The lowest country, and I won't embarrass them because they're in the room, was 5%. Jan Geisler, whom you saw yesterday, He's very interested in oral treatment of cancer and non-adherence, which is a big problem, and he's working on that from a standpoint of the patient advocate. Because when a physician tells the patient to take the treatment, that doesn't mean that it can be taken. And this was pointed out to me by Katia Apostolidis, the uh, Salzburg Global Seminar that she and others attended, calling on cl clinicians to recognize that they have an ethical imperative to share important decisions with patients. Fortunately, we also have with us, and you'll be seeing him later, Brian Vardabedian, who keeps an excellent blog called 33 Charts, gastropediatrician in Texas, and he is becoming a real social media proponent, explaining why it is of such use in the physician-patient relationship. We have Jorge Juan Fernandez, who will be telling us about why this Spanish hospital in Barcelona has been doing incredible things with social media. And we're very lucky to have uh, Lucien, who will be telling us about Radboud, and here is an example of a small community that they have created to help cancer patients. And all of this can be furthered through the use of hashtags. There is a website called Foxy Practice, which has hundreds of healthcare hashtags. You create a hashtag and you tell them about it. And you can use this to create meetings online. You say, this hashtag will meet on Twitter at a certain time. And people get together and discuss, which is something that we'll be doing with Doctors 2.0. And so what do I wish for us? I wish that we can all be partners around the content, the communities, in a mobile way, with innovation. And what does that require? It requires listening, as you did for Fred, acting, as you did when you stood up, and interacting, as you will be during the day, with the questions and the discussion. We're very proud of this slide, so you can admire it. And so, I was having a hard time. I couldn't come up with what should be this manifesto. And then I said, Denise, that's all wrong. You're not supposed to find the manifesto. This must be a collaborative effort. And so what we are proposing is that at the end of the day, we will take the last few minutes to start discussing about what this manifesto could be, and then we will continue it online. The general theme, which you can question, will be about doctor and patient uh, improving their co collaboration. And so, as I said, I was going to tell you about the program. Let me clarify it for you. Now I've gotten the hang of this thing. Um, let us find the common ground. So, beyond what I have said, we are going to be hearing in a minute from Bercy Mesco, who is going to be telling us about the latest apps and services for physicians. We'll then have a panel about physician communities. In that panel, one person will speak in French, so it's going to be translated, but if you're not wearing a headset, you won't hear it. So somebody's going to come in later wearing t-shirts to hand out headsets for those who may not have them. Then we're going to have a lovely session about hospitals, physicians, and patients, begun with the Mayo Clinic and Radboud, and then a panel. And then after lunch, we're going to talk about government involvement, the exciting startup contest, an integrated system example in Europe that combines telemedicine and social media, and then we will finish uh, before the manifesto with a pharma panel. And so I can only say one thing, let the conversation begin. Thank you. <laughs>